Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Special greetings to all of you out there on the internet. Glad to have all of you with us today as well. See a few faces today I haven't seen either in a long time, and some I don't remember at all. But welcome to all of you, the visitors that are with us today. Glad to see all of you here today. Uh, hope all of you are enjoying this nice, good spring winter weather. It's up and down. It's going to be 70 some odd degrees, I think they said by Wednesday. So the plants don't know what to do. I've already had, this is the second time now my hydrangeas have started blooming and I guess they're going to be dead again. So had a whole bunch of blossoms on our um, um, camellias and they all got killed in the last cold spell. So for the, you gardeners out there, you know what I'm talking about. In the book of John, in chapter 15 and verse 1, we find a very, very familiar statement, I think, to all of us from our Savior Jesus Christ. He said, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Again, another gardening analogy. In order for fruit to be born, a lot of times the bushes need to be purged. I am the vine, down in verse 5. You are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. I think there's no doubt that Christ's description here of himself as the vine and his followers, each of us, as the branches is a really full and rich metaphor for all who will listen to the words that he has spoken to us. So we are, is the latter part of that, to bring forth not just fruit, but it says much fruit. But you know, at the same time, I think we can all agree in the midst of Many of us who are still working, some of us are retarded now and not working as much as we used to, doing a different work. But in the midst of a work week and all the challenges that come up, sometimes some of the complex relationships that we are involved in in our family that have difficulties, uh, family conflicts, those of you that are still rearing child, ch children, the challenges that that brings up on a daily basis, uh, those that are teaching school are very familiar with that as well. There's just a lot of things that go on in life, especially the demands that accompany each of us as we live this life, a Christian life that we have been called to do. So the image of the vine and the branches can sometimes seem maybe somewhat remote, but at the same time, maybe even a little bit complicated. How do, how do we go about doing this? But what in reality is so complicated about the life of a Christian? What is it that God asks us to do? Over in John chapter 10, verse 10, and there's a bunch of scriptures that deal with this, and I'm certainly not going to go through all of them. But in John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Not just have life, not just enjoy life, but have it abundantly and really enjoy the life that we live. So we are to live as best we can, but live abundantly. When one of the lawyers of the Pharisees came before Christ and asked him, trying to trick him, that's, that's a lawyer for you. I, was, I don't think there are any in our congregation today, but uh, for any of you that may be out there, you have my apologies ahead of time, but that's lawyers. They're always trying to trick you. I'm currently reading a book uh, about an attorney, and he's a defense attorney, and he's always trying to trick the witnesses and everybody else, so uh, they know what they're talking about. He was trying to trick Christ. He said, what is the great commandment of the law? You remember what Christ's reply was? Found over in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37. And Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all of the law and all the prophets. Pretty concise, you know, little definition. Actually, to me, it sounds like it's pretty simple stuff. Love God completely. Love our neighbor as ourself. You know, we, I could say I could shut up and sit down now, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go a little bit further. Now, if you look down at the Ten Commandments, what's the number one commandment? What does the first one say? <coughs> Anybody? You shall have what? No other gods before me. Okay. Now, if you look when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, 
in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12, addressing the nation of Israel, he says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? What does God say? What does He require of us? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of His ways, to love Him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, you know, that's, again, not that difficult, is it? To keep the commandments of the Lord, which I command you this day. And here, to me, is the important part of that. For your good. God does not give us the commandments. He does not give us all the information that we see in His Word because it makes Him feel good. Well, it does make Him feel good if we do it. But it doesn't make Him any better. It's for our good. He is the maker. He is the creator. He is the one that has made us and designed us. And He knows what works. And so He gave us these rules, if you want to say, commandments, laws, statutes, judgments, precepts, testimonies, whatever you want to call them. He gave them for our good. There are several other scriptures that deal with what does God ask of us, what does He require of us. I'm just going to mention them real quickly. You're probably, willing, you're probably familiar with both of them. But just you know, write them down, look, at them, look them up later. Mac, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. And 2 Peter 3 and verse 19. Uh, verse 9, I'm sorry. That one is the one that says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not just Israel, but all should come to repentance. You know, sometimes I puzzle and I wonder, why is it some people seem to enjoy so necessarily complicating Christianity? Sometimes it seems like some people are trying to make it as complicated as they possibly can, that it's impossible for anyone to do it. Now granted, it is at times difficult. It is a difficult journey. God has said He is going to try us. He is going to prove us. An old friend of mine, who many of you will recognize, used to say that God is not going to spend eternity with a bunch of losers. He's going to be testing us and trying us and proving us. But it is not complicated. In 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now I know it's not exactly the thing that's first and foremost on all of our minds when we're having a difficulty that we need to be joyous. But we need to know that God is there. It goes on to say in verse 14, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, and on their part He is evil spoken of, but on your part... He's glorified. And then going on down in verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if one suffers as a Christian, if we suffer because of our beliefs as a Christian, the things that we're trying to do and to live our life by, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and it first begin at us. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? That's assuming that we are obeying the gospel of God. And 18, And if the righteous would scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I think this indicates, and I know there is, times of trials that we as Christians go through. We can sit here and probably each one of us give our own testimony as to some of the trials, some of the difficulties that we have gone through. But there is a scripture, if, especially if we obey, is given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where it says in verse 13, There has no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. There's nothing that has ever happened to me or to you that has not happened to someone else. And it's going to happen to someone else. Or that Christ himself may, not exactly in the same way, because we live in a different world, a different time now, but that he has gone through himself. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. That's an extremely encouraging statement to me. 
that God will not, by His promises, tempt me, try me above what I'm able to stand. Then it goes on to say, but will with that temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now I won't ask for a show of hands, but I can almost guarantee you everyone in this room has been in that particular position. You thought you couldn't handle it. You thought you couldn't go through it. But at the end, when it was over with, you realized, hmm, that wasn't so bad after all. And in my particular case, a couple of times, I know why it wasn't so bad after all. So even in trials, temptations that come our way, God will aid us. He will assist us. He will provide a way of escape, He says. But you know, sometimes it seems, and maybe I'm the only person that feels this way, that some people feel like it is their role in life to interject what are, at least in their minds, I think, intellectually challenging issues to a Christian. They seem to try to want them put themselves up on a, on a higher plane. And while I doubt that anyone intentionally sets out to, to do this, to complicate a Christian's life or to obfuscate the, the way that we should be going, although we might be sometimes wanting to question that, nevertheless it does sometimes interject questions and complications, if not confusion. And I don't think it's that we lack people who are intelligent within the church. There's a lot of very intelligent people around. All of us have a great deal of biblical knowledge. We've studied for many, many years, and we know what the Bible says. But sometimes it seems as if there are some who would seem to be trying to put things out that you know, they think we can't understand and putting people down as a result of it. What we seem to be lacking, though, from those who would purport to be in this position is a very comprehensive, a profound, and a clearly defined theology that is able to be explored and adopted to not only challenge, but to enlighten and to guide each of us as a Christian, but which at the same time is able to also interact with and challenge and illuminate like the beacon light that we're supposed to be the world around us. It is challenging, stimulating to each of us, but at the same time is a beacon to those who have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I don't think that anyone would say that the church is in the very front of intellectual thinking, that we have all mensis in this particular room and in the congregation. Everybody knows what a mensis is, where your IQ is out of the stratosphere up here those who are the geniuses. There's a new show on television called Pure Genius. I think that's the name of it. Watched it a few times and it's, they're pushing the edges of everything having to do in medicine. There are geniuses involved. And there are people like that in this world. I'm glad they're there because God has given them a special gift to do things like this. But you know, there are not too many voices from the church in general, and I'm not speaking just as of the churches of God, but in the church in general, that are able to command the attention and promote a persuasive Christian worldview that will challenge as well as enlighten. To me, the role of the Christian is not to promote confusion. It is not to complicate Christianity. But it is a something that we need to, as best we can, through the Spirit of God working with each of us, to speak the truth of God in love. The gospel message that Christ has given to us. At times it's, it seems that the most notable feature sometimes coming out from churches is those that want to, it seems like, do nothing more than debate the nature of God, the correct name of God, which days to observe what on, whether or not we should obey God in tithing or has tithing been done away with and you name it it's all kinds of other little peripheral issues that seem to be coming up sometimes you know do we have voices that are powerfully speaking the truth of God in love you know there's some who talk about authority sometimes we talk about the, the, the lack of forgiveness or maybe the latest hot issue that's going around in the church but there seems to me be a sometimes a lack of expounding and explaining the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Why did he come? What did he have to say? 
What is our responsibility as a result of that? Sometimes, again, it seems like we're frightened of being relevant. We're frightened of being persuasive into the, the community around us. It sometimes sounds like someone who has lost confidence in the truth for which we supposedly stand. And what is to me the most alarming part of it is the fact that we don't always seem to have the alarm that this is going on. Sometimes we seem to have accepted the verdict of the secular world around us that we as Christians have nothing important to say and so we adjust to accept this view ourselves. It's sort of like a muscle that's not used when you have a muscle that's atrophying. You, uh, years ago I had a, some surgery on my leg and I was in a cast almost from mid-thigh all the way down to my ankle. And when I took that cast off, my leg had atrophied considerably. I didn't have near the muscle definition, the muscle strength or anything else, and it took months for me to get back to what you might consider normal. If we're not exercising our Christian muscles, if we're not using them day to day, they're going to atrophy. And it's going to take work to get back to where we need to be. Now, in all of this, I'm not talking about a lively discussion, maybe after church between two or more people where we sit down and discuss some issue. Uh, anything that comes along like that, uh, we talk about deep theological issues or maybe just some other things that are on the periphery of that. That's, there's nothing wrong with good theological discussions. In fact, is everything right about it. Uh, but when the discussion then turns in a vitriolic manner, it turns into a personal attack or it turns into a judgmental remark and creates harm to other people. It causes division or it causes confusion between what should be Christian brethren then I think we have gone too far. I think we have, in my opinion, missed the point. I think we have missed the point of why we are here, what we're called to do, what God has given us to do. What was the basic gospel message that Jesus Christ brought to this world? It wasn't about calendar issues. It wasn't about the name of God. It wasn't the subject of tithing. It wasn't who is in authority. Although when the mother of James and John brought that subject up before Christ in Matthew 20, that her two sons might sit on his side, he did very quickly put that particular situation down because it was talking about who was going to receive authority. Christ dismissed that very quickly if you remember the story. So what was the basic gospel message? Now I'm not sure if one scripture can tell you or explain to us exactly what it is, but I have one scripture that I like that I use in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, as good as most any. Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Is that first and foremost in our mind on a daily basis? Are we definitely seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Paul gives a statement over in Romans Chapter 1, verse 16, which sort of adds to it. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is a rhetorical question, but have any of us ever been in a situation where we had a chance to speak up and we did not really want to speak up because we were possibly ashamed or possibly worried we might be embarrassed or we didn't want to put ourselves into a certain situation? That's, again, something we all have to answer for ourselves. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. The gospel message is the power of God unto salvation. You know, in deciding what to title this message, I settled on the, the title, Missing the Point. I thought about using Jedi Knight looking to Mr. Van Stenson, his message a couple of weeks ago, or gagging God. I turned those down because although I would like to claim the originality of those two points, I cannot claim either one of them. The reminder of the Jedi Knights, which is of course from Star Wars, but there was a British census taken some time ago where people on the census listed their occupation as Jedi Knights. Now if you remember what Mr. Stenson was saying, or you are familiar with Star Wars, you know that they are the warriors who battle evil. Call them spiritual warriors if you would. The other term, gagging God, 
came from an article that was sent to me on the internet written by a man by name Peter Jensen. I had never heard of him before. He's an Australian. This is the gist of what he said. Christians are commissioned by Christ to turn the world on its head and to make disciples of all nations. But we don't make disciples anymore. We make bare bones converts. We send them to bare bone churches where they get bare boned teaching. We try to get people into heaven. Obviously, he's not, you know, he's in the general church of the God. We get to pe try to get people into heaven by the skin of their teeth. And in this refusal to stand up, we do not bear our own cross and we do not interject ourselves into the world to speak intelligently and forcefully about the truth of God's word. In doing so, we have contributed to the gagging of God. Because we are not publishing the message that God gave us to do. I think if we're honest, we all know that one of the greatest failings of the church, and I think especially in the last couple of decades, has been a form of sectarianism or division over an effect, for the most part, minor administrative issues or minor administrative differences, whatever you want to call it. But at the same time, the nasty words of rivalry, of jealousy, and finances has raised their ugly heads from time to time. But the truth still remains that there is a fundamental task for each and every one of us to which we must be committed and committed 100%. And that is speaking the truth of God in love. You can't forget that last part of that. Speaking the truth of God in love. To speak about the gospel, about the very message of Jesus Christ. The message of salvation. But rather than moving on with the powerful message of salvation, we have at times seemingly withdrawn and seemingly wait for the second coming of Christ and everything will then be solved. Jensen went on to ask the question in his article, have we changed our marching hymn to backward Christian soldiers? That sort of struck a note, at least it did with me. Are we going forward with everything that we can in our lives and doing everything that we can? I think none of this, and I know none of this, is, in my opinion, is meant to in any way demean or speak evil of any one person or any organization, but to collectively encourage all of us, every person in this room, every person on the Internet, every person who may later hear this message, every person that you and I come in contact with, to examine closely and to consider if possibly somewhere along the way we have missed the point that is, of proclaiming the very gospel message of the kingdom of God, of salvation to all. In Mark chapter 16, and verse 15, it says, And he said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Have we, without knowing it, ceased to be Jedi Knights? Warriors? Battling evil? And have we missed the point of the gospel message? For it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believes. Hopefully, every day that we live, the life that we live reflects that message. Because I've said many times before, and I'll continue to say, the best sermon ever given is the very life that you and I live. We never know who's watching us, who's taking note of what we're saying, what we're doing, how we're handling ourselves. It's more powerful than any message that's ever been given from any pulpit. And are we individually and collectively as a part of the body of Christ doing everything that we can as a branch off of the vine of Jesus Christ that we can possibly do to preach the gospel message to all that we come in contact with?